All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Burrell, and I'm an entrepreneur in residence here at WeBC. Um, I'm like most of you on the call today. I had a, a business uh, for 18 years. I had a women's clothing store, or a couple of them, in uh, the Lower Mainland. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to acknowledge that today, uh, Jen and I are uh, gathered here today on the traditional and unceded territory of the Okanagan Selk people. Uh, we recognize, honor, and respect the presence of Indigenous people past, present, and future. So if any of you would like to uh, write into the chat which traditional territories that you're joining us from, from. Jen is going to post um, a map in the chat, which would be great. And while you're doing that, I'd like to uh, invite you to let us know um, at the end of this webinar, we're going to, going to do a little feedback poll. If any of you have a burning topic, you know, something that you're really interested in learning more about that you think WeBC could be a good place to learn that, please just uh, at the end of the webinar today, type into the chat, you know, what kind of um, information that you'd like to know about. Um, just your suggestions are also always welcome. And uh, yeah, the feedback poll will be at the very end of the session. So I hope you can stick around to the end. Okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what WeBC offers, what our services are. So we provide support for your small business journey. Uh, we offer financing to get your business started and operating capital to fuel growth. We offer more flexibility than traditional lenders because we take a holistic approach and we provide loans based on your business's viability, not based on formulas. So what that means is we usually need to see a business plan from you to assess you know, whether we can lend you. Uh, it, we provide loans to a diverse range of women-owned businesses and support you with integrated services, including complementary uh, training, mentoring, and business advising. And that's where we're quite different than a bank. Once we give you some money uh, to finance your business, we want to make sure that you stay in business as long as you want to be. So we help you uh, in several areas. So from essential business skills development, uh, we do all sorts of webinars. This is a, a We Cafe today. Um, to personalize business advice, we know the right questions to ask and the right resources to connect you with. In our mentoring programs, you can connect with a network of women entrepreneurs all around BC who can support and inspire you. You can learn more about all these services and everything we do at WeBC by going to we-bc.ca. And Jennifer will also put that in the chat. Okay. Um, we'd also like to remind you that when you're on our website, if you could please sign up for our eBlast newsletter. Our eBlast newsletter comes out once a month and it tells you all of the webinars, we cafes, seminars, uh, funding announcements, anything like that to do with women in business. So we'd like you to kind of stick with us that way so that we can all kind of grow together. So we've got a ton of great offers coming up. All right, so um, we'd like to welcome our panelists today, which is uh, Michael Sesniak, who is the Procurement Ambassador, Procurement Assistance Canada. You're going to see this acronym quite a bit today, which is PAC. <laughs> so um, yes, we, we'd like to welcome Michael, and uh, it's going to be a great session. Oops. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about today. So have you ever looked at an RFP or a tender and thought, where do I start? Reading and understanding tenders is not easy, but fear not. Uh, WBC is hosting Michael Sesniak from Procurement Assistant Canada to teach you what to do once you've found a relevant goods or service tender for your business to bid on. Well, Michael, and I'm going to turn it over to him right now. Michael, you can share your screen. Anybody that's on the webinar today, if you want to ask questions as you go along, you can raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. Michael will also provide his contact information. So just in case you don't get your question answered today, you can possibly have Michael get back to you at a later date. Okay, thanks a lot, Michael. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Kathy. So I'll just share my screen here, but while I'm setting up, uh, just to provide some context as to what a request for proposal is and whatnot, 
Uh, when it comes to the federal government, so the government of Canada, typically there are a few ways of doing business with us. Uh, one is to do what we call low dollar value uh, procurement. So basically when you're talking about goods, such as any like fencing equipment, uh, dogs, what have you, those would be considered goods. And that would be a low dollar value contract would be anything under $25,000 Canadian. Uh, uh, similarly, on the services side, say you're doing landscaping, catering, for example, anything under $40,000 would be considered low dollar value contract. And in those cases, the government of Canada typically seeks out quotes from a few companies, typically three, and based on that selects a supplier for that requirement. Uh, however, uh, there are other circumstances where once you're over those dollar thresholds, so over $25,000 for goods, and over $40,000 for services, in which the government of Canada and its attempts to be open, fair, and transparent uh, provides more of a formal request for proposal activity, which allows people to view all of the rules of the game up front through a document typically called a request for proposal, where you see what the requirement is in all its great detail. It also outlines how bids will be evaluated and what the work will entail over the course of the contract. So it's a very much a more formal process and that's what I'll be talking to you today. Uh, but before I do, I'll just let you know that Procurement Assistance Canada, both Stephanie Waters and I who are on the call, are with Procurement Assistance Canada, where we help educate smaller and diverse businesses about federal government contracting opportunities. And our free services are geared towards developing tailored long-term relationships with businesses all along their federal government procurement journey. So feel free to reach out to Stephanie, I, or our generic inbox that we'll be sharing later on with any questions you may have. And with that, I'll start sharing my screen here. Uh, hopefully you could see a Canada Buys website screen. Great, thanks for confirming, Stephanie. So the Canada Buys website at canadabuys.canada.ca is the source of information when it comes to finding tender opportunities for the government of Canada. But on this website, you will also find opportunities for the broader Canadian public sector. So you'll find opportunities from the provincial and territorial governments, the municipalities, uh, academic institutions, schools, hospitals, and other various crown corporations and the like. Uh, so uh, the purpose of today's uh, seminar is to dissect RFPs as opposed to finding RFPs. So I'll cut right to the chase and bring up a request for proposal document uh, that was recently issued by the federal government. And I'll just uh, put some context into this as to the federal government consists of over a hundred different departments, agencies, and whatnot. And each division and whatnot within the government may do things a little differently. So you're talking about potentially hundreds, if not thousands of different potential clients and all tend to do things slightly differently. So while this provides a good guideline of what to expect, this isn't an overall, you know, template that every single RFP in the government looks like, but they generally follow a similar, uh, you know, process rather than anything else. So on the Canada Buys website, you could typically download the request for proposal or find a link to where you can download it. 
So, so I've taken the liberty of doing that and I've brought one up on the screen here. And typically a request for proposal is broken down into several parts. Uh, and within that, and with that, you have to keep in mind that the request for proposal not only describes the tender part of it, which describes everything that you have to do before the tender deadline uh, appears, you also have to talk, it also includes the contract clauses that will result if you are the successful winner. And with that, I'll just go through it now. So typically there's a part that describes very generally the requirement. Then there's a part that talks about bidder instructions. And then there's another part that describes how to go about preparing your bid. There's typically a part that describes how bids will be evaluated and how a winner will be selected. Then there's typically a part that talks about any certifications required and any additional information that might be required with your bid or prior to contract award. And then you have a part that actually outlines the resulting contract clauses. So there should be no surprises to you once you receive a contract. And then on top of that, you have an annex, a bunch of annexes. And this is typically what you're most interested in when you're first reviewing an RFP. Because usually it contains a statement of requirement in the case of goods or a statement of work for services. And this describes in detail what you will be expected to perform uh, during the course of the contract. Then you have various other annexes typically addressing uh, how you will be paid, the prices you'll be charging or what have you, and any additional annexes that might be required. So I'll, I'll go into part one now, which once again, just provides some general information about the RFP. In this case, it highlights the requirement is detailed under 6.2 of the resulting contract. So that just points you to another section in the RFP. But then it also goes on to mention that debriefings are available. And what a debriefing is, is say you are unsuccessful, or even if you are successful, you could request a debriefing on the results of the bidding bid solicitation process. So say you want you were unsuccessful and want to learn on ways you can improve for next time, you have the opportunity to request this debriefing. And that could take place via telephone in writing, you know, video conference, in person, depending on the situation. But basically it allows you to discuss your bid with the buyer and find out where you may have gone wrong or what have you. And it's a great opportunity to improve upon for next time. And a lot of people don't take advantage of this. And it's one of those hidden gems when it comes to federal government procurement that a lot of people don't know about or tend to forget about, but it's a great way to improve. Uh, just moving on, in this case, it identifies that the requirement is subject to a preference for Canadian goods. And we'll talk about that a little later. And then there's some uh, wording here regarding environmentally preferable packaging. And in this case, uh, it notes that this bid solicitation requires bidders to use the electronic procurement solution, also known as SAP Ariba, to transmit their bid electronically. So you'll have to keep in mind in that when you're preparing your bid. You'll need to give yourself time to register for the SAP Ariba system if you, have, you don't already have an account and gain familiarity with the system. 
So definitely not something you want to leave to the last minute or the last hour. So that provides a general, some general information about the request for proposal. And now we start digging deeper into the actual tender details in part two, where it talks about bidder instructions. And the first thing you'll notice is that it says that all instructions, clauses, and conditions identified in the bid solicitation by number, date, and title are set out in the standard acquisitions clauses and conditions manual. And bidders who submit a bid agree to be bound by the instructions, clauses, and conditions of the bid and accept the clauses and conditions of the uh, resulting contract. So basically, you have to agree to the terms and conditions outlined here in this document. If you don't agree with them, now's the time to ask questions, not after you get the contract. So what does this standard acquisition clauses and conditions manual, what, what does that mean? Well, we come across this first reference by number, date, and title right here. And it says the 2003 ACB, you know, 2022 0901 Canada by standard instructions, goods or services, competitive requirements are incorporated by reference into and form part of the bid solicitation. Consider this a, a bit of a shortcut by the buyer instead of providing pages upon pages of clauses and conditions that apply to this uh, solicitation. They simply provide this reference to a standard set of instructions that you could refer to. And since these instructions don't change very often, the reference here, just to save you time from reviewing them all the time and, what, but, and whatnot, but it's also very important for you to familiarize yourself with, with these clauses. And that's a mistake I find that a lot of uh, suppliers make. They overlook these, uh, uh, these reference conditions, and then it's a big surprise to them come contract time. So let's just take a quick look at 2000, so this, to the sta uh, standard acquisition clauses and conditions manual. Mike, it's Kathy yep. Burrell here. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so would you say that uh, if you're intending, if you find an RFP and you're intending on submitting a bid, that you should have a lawyer look at this manual or, you know, somebody within your company? Or is this something that the average person can understand? Uh it, I guess it all depends on what you consider average. Uh, I think <laughs> the biggest thing here is to actually read it for yourself first, engage your comfort level. A lot okay. of this may be legalese to some and to others it makes perfect sense and whatnot. But great question there, Kathy. Uh, so the standard acquisition clauses and conditions manual includes a lot of sections that describe various clauses. And but there's a feature here called find a SAC manual item. And we'll just click on that. And that's where you could either browse for individual clauses by their ID or their number. But in this case, we'll just do the 2003 A. CB. And there are different versions based on date and whatnot, so you can look for that there. But anyway, uh, that gets into the details. But here it returns one result. And if we look at this, there's quite a long list of standard instructions associated with this RFP. 
I won't go into great detail into them, uh, but you know, it just talks about integrity provisions, a business number. Turns out that your suppliers are required to have a business number before contract award. So you'll want to register for that sooner rather than later. What is considered a bidder? In this case, it means the person or entity, or in the case of a joint venture, the persons or entities submitting a bid to perform a contract for goods, services, or both. It does not include the parent, subsidiaries, or other affiliates of the bidder or its subcontractors. I point that out simply because a lot of evaluation criteria talk about bidders, bidder experiences, and uses that terminology. You have to understand what the definition of bidder is before you could actually respond to such questions. Then it provides instructions and whatnot regarding the submission of bids, how to transmit your bid, what happens if there's a late bid. And in this case, it's very important to outline that Canada will not consider bids submitted after the bid solicitation closing date and time. That deadline they provide is very strict. Who you could communicate during the solicitation period, how to go about doing that. Legal capacity, you must have the legal capacity to contract. What the rights of Canada are. Rejection of bids, what's that all about? You might be required to justify the price of your bid. It talks about how no payment will be made for costs incurred in the preparation and submission of a bid. Talks about evaluation conduct. If you're dealing with joint, vent, uh, if you're part of a joint venture submitting a bid, there's special instructions about that. Talks about conflict of interest. And here's an in important one. The, the bid solicitation documents contain all the requirements relating to the, the bid solicitation. Any other information or documentation provided to or obtained by a bidder from any other any source are not relevant. Bidder should not assume that practices used under previous contracts will continue unless they are described in the bid solicitation. You should also not assume that the, your existing capabilities meet the requirements of the bid solicitation simply because they have met previous requirements. Basically, don't make any assumptions. All the rules of the game are outlined in the RFP and its associated documents. And more information about uh, the code of conduct for procurement. So a lot of information there. It doesn't change that often, perhaps once or twice a year but it's a great thing to familiarize yourself with as you're preparing your bid. Just going back to the actual RFP, there's instructions on here how to submit your bid. So in this case, you must submit your bid through SAP by the date, time, and place indicated in the bid solicitation. Bids will not be accepted if emailed directly to the contracting authority, neither or by fax, e-post, paper, anything like that. So always keep in mind, uh, the submission details vary depending on the RFP. Sometimes it will be SAP Ariba. Sometimes you have to mail it in or courier it in. Very important to keep that in mind as you're preparing the bid. So you have enough time to actually submit your bid before the deadline. Then there's some, uh, some somewhat unique features when dealing with government uh, contracting opportunities is that you might be provided the opportunity 
to have your say on improving either the technical requirements, uh, particular portions of the RFP clauses, the evaluation criteria or something, take full advantage of that. Similarly, when it comes to inquiries, if you have any questions, anything doesn't make sense to you, seek clarification. Unlike in the private sector where you, you're, any questions that you raise, any clarifications might have someone, your potential client starting to question your ability to do the work, that, that judgment doesn't come into play when you're dealing with federal government opportunities. Your, base, your, your, your bid will be evaluate, evaluated based on the rules of the game in the RFP. So once again, as a buyer, I've seen many suppliers miss out on this opportunity and it's cost them dearly. It's come debrief time, it's like, oh, if I only knew that, that would have changed everything. Or come contract time in the middle of the contract, it's like, what do you mean I'm responsible for customs and duties in delivering this product? Well, it was all outlined there in the RFP, but you didn't seek clarification. And even if it's something is mentioned in the RFP, but you're not quite sure, or there might be a conflict between one section and another, ask those questions. You don't want Mike, to- it's... You... Sorry, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, Mike, sorry to interrupt you. I just had a question about, so when you're, this seems like a really important part of this process, so is the actual contracting authorities contact information on the RFP or do you have yes, to really it is. That? Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. like a just sending an email and you should sending expect an email in the case of SAP RE, but they want to, you to use the system and to submit your question using the features within the system. Uh, but that will be all outlined in the RFP. And yes, the, the contact information is there. And definitely reach out to them. Uh, you know, there might be a deadline here, like in this case, no later than seven days before bid closing. Uh, that being said, they provide a little thing that inquiries received after the time may not be answered. It doesn't necessarily say that they won't be answered. They just may not be answered. So even if you're scrambling, after that deadline, reach out to them. I think we're... Baraf Reddy has a question. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if there are any verifications sought by one of the bidders, uh, will that information be shared with uh, all the bidders or all the prospective bidders? Or is it uh, yeah. like uh, information only to the bidder who is uh, asking that particular question and uh, others want to be? Yeah. Great aware. question. There. Yeah, great question. So, so when it comes to significant, you know, questions that are really important to all the bidders, say a clarification about where exactly something has to be delivered or something like that that would be answered via a formal amendment in writing to all for everyone to see. Uh, if it's something simply, if it's something like, oh, when is the bid closing date? You know, that is already publicly available information. So th that type of answer typically wouldn't be repeated again uh, via uh, RFP amendment. But if the bidder asked for an extension to the deadline and that extension was granted, then there would be an RFP amendment to revise the closing date uh, for bid submissions. Thank you so much. Uh, so next up, you, it talks about applicable laws. Uh, so in this case, uh, 
the laws enforced for this contract will be the British Columbia. But you, if you prefer the applicable laws of another Canadian province or territory to take precedence, you could provide that in your bid and that will be of, of no consequence. Another benefit of dealing with the federal government is that you have several bid challenge and recourse mechanisms available to you to challenge aspects of the procurement process up to and including contract award. So if you feel that the solicitation favored a particular vendor, I uh, had concerns about the way things were evaluated or what have you, you could raise these to to various parties and that those mechanisms are identified in the RFP. That being said, there are strict deadlines involved. So you'll wanna make note of them and follow through on them if you want to challenge it. And then in this case, they talk about if you have technical difficulties with bid transmission and whatnot. Uh, since we're running short on time, I'll quickly move on to the next section, which is part three, bid preparation instruction. And this will start outlining the basic points when it comes to preparing your bid. And typically, the evaluation team will want to have your bid separated into separate uh, sections. Uh, typically, a technical bid portion which addresses how you will perform the work or address the requirements. A separate section, so either a separately binded, uh, you know, bunch of papers or a separate computer file addressing the financial bid. And a third one regarding certifications and additional information. Basically, they don't want any financial information in with the rest of the bid. They don't, uh, bids are typically broken out into various evaluation teams. One evaluates the tac technical aspects and another, and then the contracting authority considers the financial bid afterwards. They don't wanna see any financial information in the technical bid in case it influences uh, the technical evaluation. Now, typically the contracting authority will review the technical bid to ensure there's no financial information there and redact it if there is any, but you know, everyone's human. And when you're looking at potentially hundreds of pages worth of documents, something could always slip by. So best to separate it just so you don't jeopardize your bid on a formality like that. So it starts outlining more in detail what you have to include in your technical bid. And we'll, you should explain and demonstrate how you propose to meet the requirements and how you will carry out the work. In this case, it tells you which forms you should submit with your technical bid. And these are included in the annex section at the back. Then the financial bid section talks about how to submit your bid, which in this case has to be in accordance with Annex B. Say, for example, you disagree with the pricing scheme. Say it's asking for a unit price. You know, like, uh, I've got fences on my mind today. I don't know why, but we'll say, say it wants 10 fence posts and it wants a price for each uh, fence post and you're willing to sell them by the dozen, well, you're going to have to price your bid based on that unit price, which is quantity of 10, but they want to see pricing on a per unit basis. So each one, they don't care if you could provide a great price on 12, they want pricing based on the unit pricing request, uh, demanded in the RFP. Uh, then if you ex uh, 
are willing to accept payment of invoices by electronic means. There's information about that. And then here's something that's often overlooked by bidders, exchange rate fluctuation. Now that's been a key concern over the past few years in particular. If that is something that is of concern to you, definitely be on the lookout for any clauses that talk about that. And if not, reach out to the contracting authority to find out what the situation is on that. In this situation, uh, let me just bring it up here. I would, I would run a search for that clause in the SAC manual. There you go. I had it all prepared, but there's too many now to pick here. So, uh, so in this case, that C3011T clause says that the requirement does not offer rate fluctuation risk management. Request for exchange rate fluctuation risk mitigation will not be considered. All bids, including such provision, will be render the bid non-responsive, which basically means non-compliant and your bid will receive no further consideration. Other times they will include some risk mitigation when it comes to exchange rate fluctuation. Best to review that ahead of time and then price your bid accordingly. You can't come back afterwards and say, Oh no, the US dollar went up 50% since we signed the contract. I, I can't afford to sell this to you at, this, at the price we, I set out in the bid. Well, you entered a contract to fulfill that at that set price in Canadian dollars. The government really doesn't care. <laughs> You're in a binding contract. Section three then talks about any certifications and additional information required. Uh, next part talks about evaluation procedures and basis of selection. So this outlines how bids will be evaluated and who the successful bidder or bidders will be. So bids will be assessed in accordance with the entire requirement of the bid solicitation, including technical and financial evaluation criteria. An evaluation team of representatives of Canada will evaluate the bids. And in this case, because there was a requirement or a conditional requirement for Canadian content, it talks about how that process will take place. Then it talks about the mandatory technical criteria that form part of the technical evaluation. Each bidder will be reviewed and whatnot according to these requirements. It's very important to demonstrate that you meet each mandatory technical criterion identified in Annex A with supporting documentation. You'll note that Canada will not make any assumptions regarding unclear or incomplete responses. Canada will only evaluate documentation provided as part of the submission. Canada will not evaluate information such as references to website addresses where additional information can be found. Common mistake, bidders will just put a link to a web page or website and say, uh, that's my tech sheet. You could find it there. And they don't actually include a printout or a copy of the technical data sheet or what have you or specifications with their bid. Well, like it says here, Canada will not evaluate information such as references to website addresses. So if it's not actually in the bid itself and Canada needs that information, it won't be evaluated and you risk being deemed non-responsive.
then financial evaluation is discussed. In this case, I won't go into the SAC manual clause, but basically it says that, you know, we'll be based in, on Canadian dollars based, based, on, based on these delivery terms. And we'll talk about that a little later. And then how the basis of selection will be done. And in this case, it will be based on mandatory technical criteria. Once again, the details can be found in that SAC manual clause. Then part five talks about certifications and it breaks that down by certifications required with the bid, others, any others that are required with the bid. In this case, they want a Canadian content certification if applicable. It also provides a definition of what is considered Canadian content via this referenced clause. Then there talks about certifications required prior to contract award. And any other ones. So that concludes the instructions on how to go about submitting your bid and preparing your bid and all that. Now we move into the resulting contract clauses. And these will apply to form part of any contract resulting from the bid solicitation. Mike? Yep. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, we only have about 15 minutes left and there are some really good questions in the chat. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we should maybe uh, cover those and then circle back just because there are some really good conversations um, to All be right. had from these uh, as well. Give me five minutes. Absolutely. <laughs> I warned Kathy that I'll, I could talk for this for hours. Uh, so very quickly, just because it's very important. So contract clauses, once again, includes, includes general conditions, just like the standard instructions contains a long list of items that you have to consider. Talks about the delivery date. When must all deliverables be received? Shipping instructions. In this case, uh, goods must be consigned, delivered, duty paid. If you're not familiar with INCO terms and they're talking about INCO terms, you better figure out what your INCO term obligations are. They're a set of standard uh, obligations that uh, sellers and buyers have when it comes to delivery. And that could pose significant costs to you. So you'll want to familiarize yourself with INCO terms ahead of time so you could bid your price your bid accordingly. Then it talks about delivery and unloading. You'll want to confirm that that doesn't conflict with any INCO terms and seek clarification where required. Then it provides uh, the contact information of the contracting authority. This is the person you would contact, like Kathy was asking, uh, for any questions regarding this tender opportunity. They are the source of truth regarding. It doesn't matter what Mike says or what Stephanie says, anyone else but this contracting authority. What they say is gold. Nothing else matters. Not even the technical authority. If they, if you, they, you bump into them on the street and they tell you something, that doesn't matter unless it's in the RFP. Uh, when it comes to payment, very important. How will you get paid? When will you get paid? In this case, you have to satisfactory complete all of your obligations under the contract before you could submit an invoice, and then you will be paid in a single payment. Once again, keep that in mind. Keep in mind what the payment terms are in the general conditions. 
How long does Canada have before they have to pay you upon receipt of an acceptable invoice? Not just any invoice, but an acceptable invoice that they accept as meeting all the requirements stated in the contract. Very important. Talks about invoicing instructions. You, the invoices that you send out to other customers might not meet the same meet the requirements as the government's. Then there are talks about priority of documents, uh, various parts. If there's any conflict, which ones take priority? Dispute resolution. And then the actual Annex A. So this is typically what I tell people to, when they first get a tender package, this is the first thing they should look at. What are you expected to do as part of the contract? And then Annex B talks about pricing. How will, this, these are the expectations on how you're supposed to price your bid on a per unit basis in this case, based on DDP in terms 2020, inclusive of all delivery, installation, commissioning, travel, and living expenses and customs duties, applicable taxes extra, bid accordingly. And then other annexes. And with that, that pretty much sums up a typical RFP. Like I said, they will be slightly different based on your client and whatnot. And I'll pass it over to Stephanie for all the great questions in the chat. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, starting out, uh, let's do this one really quickly. Um, this is how do you know if we have a product or service that would qualify for government bids? And I believe that that uh, might just be a little bit of confusion. Um, so the bids that are getting that you're submitting are in response to a requirement the government has. So the government will uh, provide the product or service, and then it is up to the business owner to respond with a bid. Um, so it's not the other way around where you're suggesting a product and then the government's putting it out to tender. Um, you're you're going to be responding to the tenders that government provides. Um, so hopefully that clears that up. If not, let me know. Um, yes. Uh, Barath, we will be sharing in the links and resources in a follow-up email from WeBC. Uh, that will be provided later on today. Uh, these ones are for you, Mike. Uh, this one is no price breaks input permitted. And I believe this was in response to the um, unit pricing section. Right, uh, not overly familiar with what price breaks means, but if you have any questions regarding pricing, ask the contracting authority. They might not have thought of something. Yes, the absolutely. inquiry period is the time to ask questions. And this might change depending on the uh, tender as well. So it's not necessarily gonna be a um, one-time answer for all tenders you come across. So definitely, if it's not specified, ask that question. Um, will there be a move to change to AI-driven consistent bid submissions for ease of evaluation? We could dream, can't we? Uh, the government <laughs> is in the process of modernizing its procurement practices, and AI is definitely something that will be probably top of mind. Absolutely. Hopefully. Um, does this discuss the evaluation weighting criteria? I don't remember what this was in yeah, reference so, to. So, so when it comes to financial pricing and whatnot and how that how pricing will be evaluated, that's typically outlined in the evaluation procedures. 
Uh, this is a very simple example that I provided to the U, which was based, I believe, solely on price. But like you're alluding to, Christine, there are various means of evaluating the best bid. Uh, some are based solely on technical aspects. Others are a combination of price, technical merits, amongst other criteria. So uh, those criteria and of weightings are outlined in the RFP. And if not, uh, definitely ask that question to the contracting authority in case they forgot to attach that annex. Yes. Um, are the bids we are submitting actually only in response to an RFP? Would love Mike to talk about the difference between an RFP, I believe in an RF, RFQ, or it says RPQ. Um, I'm not I'm not familiar with an RPQ, but an RFQ or an RFP would make sense to me. Yeah, I'm not familiar with an RPQ either, but I assume it's RFP. I think oh, so. sorry, F RFQ. RFP, and, RFQ. And with a different the difference between an RFP and an RFQ. Uh, typically, an RFQ, at least from a federal government perspective, is a lot more short form, a lot less formal. Uh, typically involves those low dollar value procurements that I talked at the very beginning, where you're talking about goods purchases under $25,000 and those for services under $40,000, uh, basically less formal in most cases. Yes, absolutely. Where you're um, typically just ask for a price and a quick outline of what you're willing to offer as opposed to a full blown response detailing how you'll go about doing the work and the pricing involved. I'm um, sensing there might be a chance for another WeBC uh, uh, um, We Cafe on that, Mike. So stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Save the date. Um, <laughs> will there be any upper or lower limit to price quoted? Can somebody quote way too low or higher than anticipated price range? Will be the, will there be any price estimation tender value? Uh, so sometimes you'll find RFPs that identify a budget associated with them. Uh, they're relatively far and in, you know, far and wide, you know, not very, uh, it's not very frequently done, particularly on the good side. Uh, most government buyers expect suppliers to propose their best price. That's the expectation. Uh, there is that price justification clause in the standard instructions that allows the buyer to question the pricing provided, in which case uh, the supplier would have to justify the price. But typically, no upper and lower limits unless specified in the RFP. And Mike, it's Kathy Burrell again. We only have about five minutes left, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody on the call today understands the fact that this webinar uh, will be sent to you via email later today or early tomorrow, where you can replay it as many times as you want. There'll be a recording. And if Jen already hasn't, in the chat, there will be a link to Mike's contact information in specific and then if, again, you know, Mike's uh, said several times, if you have a specific RFP in mind, you would be talking to the contract authority. So a lot of these questions are general just now. Um, but any, uh, I was going to say any last words, Mike, that sounds terrible. But <laughs> so, is there anything else you'd no, like to say I, before I, yeah. you kind of throw it back thanks. to me? Thanks, Kathy. I really appreciate the opportunity that we BC has presented today. If there's any parting comments before I go, is I encourage people to ask questions. Don't make okay. any assumptions. Uh, we're we at Procurement Assistance Canada really want you to succeed. Your success is our success, 
And same goes for the contracting authority for any particular RFP. You know, a lot of times they don't get many bids. So yeah. the more bids they see, the better it is for everyone. So uh, reach out to them if you have any particular questions about an RFP. And don't be and afraid to ask questions. To us question. as well. This is not uh, the only time that we are accessible. Uh, Procurement Assistance Canada offers sessions, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings to the public at any time, free of charge. Um, so don't be panicking right now, trying to think of everything you might want to know or ask us. Uh, yeah. Watch the recording, take notes, look at the tender, wh whatever it might be. Um, yeah. Email Mike or I, and we will chat with you more at any time. So um, keep that in mind as well. Ask questions to the contracting authority, ask questions to us. Uh, there are resources available to you at all times. Um, but yeah, always so fun. And but thank you so much to WeBC. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike. Uh, you lived up to all of our expectations. I mean, it was pretty fascinating stuff. And yes, if there is, this is not our first rodeo with PAC. I mean, we do these sessions fairly often. And the thing that I think people always come away with is the idea that you don't have to be alone in this, you know, as a, as an entrepreneur, maybe you consider yourself a small entrepreneur, a medium entrepreneur, whatever it is, there are people around to ask general questions at, at, um, uh, pack. And, and basically then there are specific questions that you can ask to the contract authority for specific, um, tender, which is, you know, again, we could go on, I'm sure Mike, you could have talked another three hours. I'm sure, you know, I mean, these are pretty in depth and, you know, again, for those of us that have been out of school for maybe 40 years, this reminds me of test taking where you have to do your research, you have to, you know, read it and then read it again and have your partner in business read it one more time before you, you know, submit your bid. But um, we really appreciate the time that you take uh, to to go through this with our, um, our participants, uh, a lot of them business women with really good um products that possibly could appeal to the government so thank you again i want to just uh let everybody know that uh in the chat today again and when you get your email from webc there's going to be information uh contact information for mike and stephanie uh, but i just want to draw your attention again to another couple of free we cafes that we're doing this month and next month um, building a business without the burnout. That sounds like a fascinating one. We haven't done that before. Overcoming your resistance and embracing virtual networking. Again, it's winter or winter's coming and we don't know what COVID is going to do or RF, um, yeah, the uh, virus, uh, everything. So, you know, basically learning how to network virtually is is another, just a, an arrow in your quiver to, to kind of learn more. Um, and again, to find out all of our We Cafes and everything, please register for our eBlast newsletter. Um, when you get your uh, email from us later today, there will be a link for you to do that, which is great. And uh, finally, thank you everybody for joining us. You know, uh, it's it's an hour out of your day, but I hope you really uh, got a lot out of it and think about it and ask uh, Stephanie and Mike some questions at your own pace and good luck to everybody that's bidding. Um, please visit our website for more information, we dash so in or you, you would yeah. say you already saw the demo at at Sense of So <laughs> we're just gonna say goodbye everybody. Um and uh we'd uh, like to to see you at the next webinar. Um, what will happen is Jen is now going to do a feedback poll. And as I mentioned before, if anybody has an idea that they want uh, for a, a future webinar, please put it in. Um, just send us a little note and let us know. And if we can help you, we will. And so take a few minutes to fill out the feedback poll. Thank you all for being here. I hope everyone enjoys their day. And an extra big thank you to Mike and Stephanie. Thank you for another super informative um, session.
and keep in touch, everybody. This is not the last you're going to hear from Pure Procurement Assistance Canada, and it's certainly not the last you're going to, you know, th this could be life changing getting a bid so uh, accepted. So it's really great information. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you.